thank you very much for the introduction and uh, for this opportunity in, in general. I'm really happy to give this presentation. And uh, yeah, so I guess we can start right away. I will just share the screen. So today I will talk to you about X-ray and neutron scattering from wood. And uh, well, I come from Finland, which is a country in the Northern Europe. And as you may know, uh, Finland is a land of forests and lakes. And this is quite literally so. So almost 80% of the area of Finland is covered by forests, where uh, also 10% uh, is lakes. So also the Finnish industry is quite dependent on the forest and uh, the forest sector is strong and uh, the main products are paper uh, and wood, pa paper goods and wood products. So the, this is how, how it has been for a long time already. But more lately, there are um, <clears throat> other trends like circular economy, which means the, like reusing and recycling of materials and not wasting anything, like re reusing everything. One example of this is uh, cellulosic textiles that can be made out of waste textiles. So the cellulose there can be dissolved and uh, turned into a new new textile. Often the idea in the current applications of wood is also to increase the value by processing. And the, an ultimate example of these are the nanomaterials based on wood, which have applications in, uh, in very different fields. One is shown here, uh, which is a coating made of cellulose nanocrystals, which are the kind of building blocks of the wood cell wall. If you um, let them evaporate from a solution on a surface, wood surface like this, they form this kind of uh, ordered structures that produce really beautiful iridescent colors. <clears throat> anyway, so in this light, I think it's not that uh, surprising that when I started my PhD at the University of Helsinki Department of Physics, my topic was related to cellulose. So I used X-ray and neutron scattering to study the structure of cellulosic materials uh, that had under, undergone different kinds of processing. And it also already during that time, I got interested in the, like the native structure of the plant cell wall and uh, especially how it's synthesized in the nature. And this is what drove me to Japan, where I did my first postdoc at the Kyoto University. There I studied cellulose biosynthesis using bacterial systems. After that, I returned to Europe, to Grenoble, France. Uh, I worked at the Institut Laue Langevin, ILL, uh, as a postdoc. And there, my task was to develop a, a model for analyzing small angle scattering data from wood. And two years ago, about two years ago, I returned to Finland to Espo, at, and I'm now based at the Aalto University, where where I am studying the moisture behavior of wood with X-ray and neutron scattering. So today I will talk mostly about the work I've done during the past about three years. Now, first of all, uh, why, why does it make sense to use scattering to study the structure of wood? I think first we have to uh, study or look, look into the uh, structure of wood. So wood is a highly hierarchical natural material. Uh, you know that in the macroscopic scale, it looks like something like this. When you look it with the optical microscope, you can see the cells in this transversal section. And inside of the cell walls, uh, you can find different layers where the thickest one is the secondary, the S2 layer of the secondary cell wall. And in this uh, cell wall, it consists of, uh, of 
these kind of pilar elements that are strongly oriented roughly in the direction of the cell itself or the longitudinal axis of the cell. So it's a highly oriented structure. And the basic unit there is the cellulose microfibril. That's a semi-crystalline aggregate of roughly 20 cellulose chains. And these microfibrils are aggregated together into bundles separated by hemicellulosis and also water is included in the structure. Lignin is another component that is uh, included in the cell wall. And the material properties of, cell, of wood are really closely related to the structures in this uh, length scale or in, in the uh, nanoscale, especially due to the orientation. And in these new applications of wood in the uh, preparation of nanomaterials and so on, this level of the structures is, is highly important. So this is where we will concentrate also today. Now there are different methods that we can use to study the structure of wood and uh, maybe the clearest, uh, re clearest picture you can get with, with microscopy methods like AFM or SEM, which can show you the microfibril bundles. This is however, <coughs> This, however, ever requires that one cuts the cell wall. So uh, even if it would be possible to measure in a hydrated state, one has to still somehow expose the structure by cutting the cell wall. Then there are spectroscopic methods, which has yielded a lot of information, during, especially during recent years, about the assembly of, of the different cell wall components. And uh, then tomographic methods, where the X-ray tomography usually has a, doesn't have high enough resolution to, to see these scale structures. And electron tomography, which can see a very small area or volume in the sample. But uh, there's still quite a lot of things that are not known from the native structure of the wood cell wall. And it's, of course, important to use different methods to achieve a cohesive, cohesive picture. But today we will concentrate on the scattering methods and what, what they can tell about the wood nanostructure. The scattering method, methods have, have some great benefits. Uh, first of all, they are non-invasive and you can literally take a sample from the wood and uh, from the forest and cut it to a bit smaller piece and then put it into the beam and get some decent data from that. And uh, these methods provide the average of the nanoscale structure in the whole sample or whole path of the beam, which uh, is an asset, uh, at least in the way that, that one gets a reliable uh, average structure instead of a small detail. But maybe one of the greatest benefits of these methods is, the, is the, uh, that one can vary the conditions or the sample environment, including temperature, moisture, mechanical load, and so on. But then, of course, these methods have challenges also. And maybe the most obvious one is that the data uh, is presented in reciprocal space. So instead of getting a nice uh, microscopy image which shows you what is where and everything nicely in the real space, one gets something like this, which has to be interpreted via models. And uh, another thing is the averaging nature of the met method, uh, which of course, it gives a reliable average, but then at the same time, you lose the sense of the details, unless using a high resolution X-ray beam. And uh, <clears throat> then there are some challenges that are more general to uh, bio-based materials, which I try to illustrate with this example. So instead of being something like this with uh, uh, 
well-organized structure and uh, well-defined surfaces and nice symmetry and so on. The biomaterials are something like this. So uh, they are very heterogeneous and uh, have a low degree of order. You don't even know exactly what is inside of the material and they can be very sensitive to, to the environment. But anyway, there's quite a lot of information that we can get from wood with scattering methods. And uh, just to shortly introduce for those who are not that familiar with scattering methods, uh, it's based on, on the interaction of X-rays or neutrons with the sample. So basically, uh, X-rays interact with electrons and neutrons with the atomic nuclei. And they are sensitive to the spatial, to spatial variation of scattering length density, which can be in the scale of, uh, or which can mean individual atoms or, or larger uh, electron or scattering length density distributions, depending on the angle of observation. So we have a, here some kind of scattering, some kind of particle or, or similar, and X-ray or neutron wave coming to it and then it scatters at different locations in the sample and depending on the mutual arrangement of these um, entities in the inside of the scatterer there will be interference at certain scattering angles on the detector which we then detect and uh, in this presentation, I will, I, instead of using the two theta, I will use the scattering vector Q, which is defined like this. And that's independent of the wavelength of the used radiation. So for wood, uh, <clears throat> we have a wood sample and X-ray coming to it. At the, uh, close to the sample, we have the scattering at white angles white angle X-ray scattering wax. You can see already here that the pattern is strongly oriented and that's due to the oriented structure of the secondary cell wall. And then if we move the detector further, we see the small angle X-ray scattering, which has also the similar orientation. And now these two types of scattering um, tell about the structures in different length scales. So in the wide angle regime, we see uh, scattering from the cellulose crystals. So the arrangement of the cellulose molecules. And then at the small angles, we see, we kind of zoom out in the structure to see the microfibril uh, dimensions of the microfibril and then the packing of the microfibrils. So yes, we can access the hierarchical structure like this. Now I will show in a bit more detail about the two wax and sucks or white and small angle scattering. So it, as I said, wax is sensitive to the cellulose crystal lights. And that means that uh, in wax, we can see these kind of diffraction peaks from the ordered cellulose microfibers or crystals and their different peaks correspond to different directions in the crystal. So in the lateral uh, lateral plane, which is shown here on the equa equator, if the sample is vertically aligned, in, on the equator we can see the these three reflections and then in the meridional we can see the reflection 004 from the longitudinal direction of the crystals. And these diffraction peaks can be separated from the, uh, from the diffraction profile, but there are different ways of doing this and I will not go uh, deeply into that. I just say that this is one way of doing it and it's not necessarily the best way. There's a lot of discussion about this and uh, the shape of the amorphous contribution or less ordered contribution and so on. But what we can get uh, 
quite easily from the data is the D spacings. So the spacings between the molecules here in different directions based on the peaks or peak locations on the Q axis and then the crystal size or more accurately coherence length of, of the crystalline order, which is obtained from the peak broadening using the Scherer equation, which is again a very approximate, um, approximate way of determining the crystal size. <coughs> then in the small angle scattering, uh, First of all, the different hierarchical levels contribute to uh, different uh, regions of the scattering vector Q. So at the, at the low angles, we see the, this power loss in both sucks and suns, the power loss from larger pores or voids or the cell lumina, meaning the cell cavities, central cavities of the cells or the surfaces of, of them. And then at higher Q values, we see uh, scattering from the microfibers. And especially this kind of shoulder or peak feature, which corresponds to the uh, mutual or the, the regular packing distance of the microfibers. It's also that X rays and neutrons see a slightly different landscape of the scattering length density. And uh, the, this is probably why the they look slightly different here. But in a kind of general case, the wet wood looks like something like this. So that there's uh, the crystalline cellulose microfibers and they are surrounded by uh, uh, another phase. So if we assume a two phase system, then the other phase is, is uh, the less ordered polymers and water. Then when you dry the wood, the contrast between the microfibrils decreases and then the power law becomes stronger, which is due to the surfaces of these air filled pores. <coughs> Another uh, thing here is the contrast variation, which is possible with suns. And that is used quite a lot by, uh, in the way that, that one replaces H2O by D2O to reduce the the uh, Q-independent background and also to enhance the, this peak feature here. <coughs> and to uh, interpret the data, uh, SANS and SACS data from wood. So during my time at the ILL, I developed this model called WoodSAS, which I just basically put together from existing, almost already existing models. And it's based on hexagonal, uh, infinite hexagonal arrays of infinite cylinders, which are oriented in the same direction. So these cylinders here represent the cellulose microfibers. And uh, their center to center distance in wet wood is about uh, four nanometers. So the noted by A and uh, three nanometers in dry wood and the microfibril diameter, uh, which is two times the radius R is a bit over two nanometers. Here you can see a, a equatorial anisotropic sun's intensity from pine wood in D2O, which shows these different contributions. So this is the microfibril contribution, this first term of the model, then the, um, this contribution here is the power law from the larger pores or cell lumina. And then what remains there, uh, I had to include some kind of term there to approximate the scattering in this area or Q, Q range. And as the simplest uh, possible model, I choose, chose the Gaussian function centered at Q is zero. And in the there can be different interpretations for this, and it depends on, a bit on the case. But at least, um, at least in the case of suns, uh, it uh, it has been just uh, the, this paper was just uh, accepted for publication this week. So uh, here we show how it's related to the cellulose microfibril bundles. So. 
this picture shows the native wood in D2O, where the the contributions from the microfibers and the pores or the power law have been subtracted, and th this is what remains. And a similar contribution could be found when we uh, impregnated the samples with polyethylene glycol, which is used for wood preservation. And it goes to the sample and it fills the voids, the water-filled pores, and that therefore reduces the scattering in the power law region. So in that way, we could, we could see this contribution more clearly and assign it to the microfibril bundles. At the same time, this contribution was shifted to higher Q values as compared to the native wood. And this was, uh, was interpreted in the following way. So in the native state, the microfibril microfibrils form bundles of roughly this size and about four nanometers, at least in softwood, softwoods. And then in the presence of PEG, the polyethylene glycol, it goes to these areas which, which contain water earlier and kind of suck the water out from the microfibril bundles so that the microfibril bundles shrink. And uh, <clears throat> so in this way, sounds can be used to determine the, the diameter of the microfibril bundles in native wood. And that means without any cutting or, or freezing or, or any kind of treatment to the sample. And from this model, if using this Gaussian term, then if one assumes the Guinier law, that it corresponds to the Guinier law and the cross-section is circular, then this is the equation to get the bundle diameter. And this kind of, the, this approach produces values for the bundle diameter that vary a bit between different types of wood, but at least in soft wood, they are very similar to what was determined before with AFM. And in hard woods, a bit smaller and smaller especially when the wood is dried. <clears throat> so now we will go to the uh, last major topic here. So the moisture effects in wood nanostructure. And first of all, why is it important to understand these things? Well, uh, as I said before already, the nanoscale structure is very important for the material properties of wood. And wood is also highly sensitive to moisture. You know that if, if you have a dry piece of wood and you wet it, it becomes soft. Also, if you dry wood from the native state, then it can form cracks like this. And also a lot of processing of wood takes place in aqueous environments. So it's very important to know where the, where the water exists in the structure, because then if the water carries some chemicals or or other things, then, then it's important to know. And water has, or moisture and water have also an important role in the self-assembly of these new nanomaterials. So for instance, if you take these uh, cellulose nanocrystals, which are microfibers that are just uh, chopped into small pieces with acid hydrolysis, if you, they are, they are in an aqueous suspension. So if you dry them, then they form those uh, ordered liquid crystalline phases and, and uh, ordered structures. And to study these uh, moisture effects on the nanoscale structure of wood, we have now a really great possibility at Alta University because we, we received this Xenox Xeus 3 Saxwax device just this autumn. And uh, the nice thing there is that, that we have a humidity chamber, which we can use to control the humidity and temperature of the sample. So we can take a wood sample and put it inside and then measure the scattering as a function of humidity. And this example is uh, <coughs> data from, from this autumn. So 
SOX, uh, SOX data was collected at 300 millimeter sample to detector distance and then VOX data with the same detector but using a virtual detector mode at a bit closer distance. And there's, we also collected the data in the other direction. So from this equatorial data here, you can see clearly that uh, there's a change with moisture. And to treat the, the uh, small angle scattering data, we subtracted the isotropic contribution. And that's done uh, so that one takes the azimuthal profile at every value of Q, which is shown here. And then taking the minimum of the azimuthal profile at every each value of Q, one gets this uh, isotropic contribution. So then, then one can subtract the isotropic contribution from the total equatorial intensity to get the anisotropic portion. And uh, so the, analyzing this, uh, we used the Woodsas model to fit it and got these results, so, uh, which are in line with, with previous uh, publish, published results as well. So the contribution of this shoulder feature decreases with humidity and the big or the shoulder is shifted to larger Q values. So this is related or reflected to the scaling factor, uh, which decreases with humidity as well as the interfibrillar distance. So when the water is removed from between the microfibrils, they go closer to each other. And uh, <clears throat> similar results have been obtained with SUNS. Uh, so that the peak decreases and shifts to higher Q values. And now also the bundle diameter can be analyzed and it, it shows a shrinking effect. But uh, the, one, uh, I, I should remind also that this depends slightly on the wood species or on the type of wood. So, so the microfibril, fibril to fibril distance is usually higher in softwoods than hardwoods, for instance. So um, that affects the results as well. And then this is the wax data, wide angle scattering data. And there we can see actually that the moisture modifies the cellulose crystallites. That's uh, probably because they, they consist of such a few num such a small number of molecules that the surrounding water can have an effect on their packing. So what we see there is in the lattice spacings, the uh, lattice spacing in the 200 direction increases slightly or by roughly 1% depending on the wood species and so on. And in the longitudinal direction, there's a very small decrease. And at the same time, the uh, calculating the crystal size or coherence length based on the Scherer equation, one can observe that the uh, crystal size decreases in both of these directions. So the peaks become broader. And this indicates that the state of order in the crystallized, crystallized is actually higher in the presence of water. And this, this has been observed with other methods, methods as well. And it could be related to the, some kind of drying uh, induced stresses in the structure. One uh, possible mechanism is this, that uh, the cellulose microfibril, it's covered by hemicellulosis which are hydrated and then when the water is removed the matrix uh, hemicellulose matrix shrinks and at the same time it contracts the microfibril in the longitudinal direction and then due to the adjacent microfibril microfibrils here on both sides it kind of pulls the uh, crystal apart in the lateral direction <clears throat> So the, there are still many things uh, to explain here, including this mechanism, what happens. And uh, one way to solve 
or uh, one approach that we have chosen now is this uh, in this uh, project that uh, was funded by the FinServes Materials Cluster, which is a flagship program of the Academy of Finland uh, for Aalto University and VTT, Technical Research Center of Finland. So our colleagues at VTT are able to model the, the microfibril bundles in the atomic scale and reproduce this kind of uh, uh, wet dry uh, assembly of the of the microfibers and also it's possible to calculate the scattering intensities from these models and this in one way this approach benefits the modeling side because it's then possible to compare the models to experiments uh, and it also gives, for me especially, it gives new insights to the interpretation of the experimental data. We can also try some model systems like, like a microfibril without hemicellulosis, which is almost impossible to produce without, uh, in real life without somehow changing the structure. So this is what, what we are doing now and next. And uh, this is actually where I want to conclude. So I hope that uh, I managed to, to uh, deliver you the, the message about the wood nanostructure and how it's important for the new applications and how the scattering methods are really excellent tools for analyzing this these uh, structures and there are still many aspects to explore in both the good nanostructure and the scattering analysis and with this i would like to thank all the collaborators and supervisors and people who have contributed to this work and also the large scale facilities for beam time and funding sources for funding so thank you very much <laughs>